He won the most votes in last month's federal election, but alas for conservatives, not the most seats. When Parliament reconvenes next month, Aaron O'Toole will resume his role as leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. This has been a whirlwind last year and a half for the MP from Durham. Winning his party's leadership during a global pandemic, getting COVID himself, and appearing to have the Liberals very much on the run during the election campaign. Now, he and his fellow Conservatives have to figure out if he's the right guy to lead the party going forward. And with that, we welcome, for his first one-on-one -on -one interview since the election, Conservative Party leader Aaron O'Toole. Very nice to have you in that chair. Good to be back with you, Steve. My first real interview winning leadership was with you, but I was in a hotel room yes, I remember giving that. that interview. I do remember that. Well, we should do a little housekeeping off the top here because you are, in fact, the one and only guest we have actually had in this studio in the last 19 months. We somehow got a, a special exemption for you, I think because we're both double vaxxed, mm -hmm. we've both had COVID, <laughs> we're six feet apart right now, we do have three camera operators in the studio right now. They are all double vaxxed and they are all masked up and they are all six feet apart. So we think we're pretty safe right now and everything's kosher going forward. And I won't speak moistly either, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I know what that's a reference to. Very good. Uh, Sheldon, our director, if you would, let's put the first graphic up, please, because we want to remind everybody what the people of Canada had to say on the 20th of September. They gave the Liberals, in their wisdom, 160 seats, the Conservatives 119, the Bloc Québécois 32, New Democrats 25, and the Green Party two seats. Aaron, what do you think Canadians said with their votes on the 20th of September? Well, they, Mr. Trudeau spent $600 million on an election to get virtually the same parliament, Steve. Obviously, I'm disappointed. I thought I put forward a campaign to talk about change, talk about our economic risks coming out of COVID. But the result really was people were still nervous about the pandemic. In the last week, they saw some provinces having difficulties. And I think many people that were kicking the tires with the Conservatives didn't buy the car. And so we have to continue to do the hard work needed to win the trust of those people, and I'm committed to do that as leader. Did you think you'd win more than 119 seats at the beginning of the election campaign? Well, people were predicting the demise of the Conservative Party. They said we'd go down to 70 seats. Uh, one one uh, prognosticator said I wouldn't win my own seat in Durham. And yeah, but at some point, it looked like you were going to win the whole thing. We, we were doing very well in the middle when we were talking about our economic recovery. We were talking about inflation, which is, again, hitting records today, Steve. So. When we were talking about the way forward, securing the future, we were winning. But people got nervous again at the end uh, of the campaign. Mr. Trudeau called the campaign knowing the modeling would do that. And so he, he used COVID for his political advantage. I thought it was wrong to have a pandemic election. I still think that. But we have to learn the lessons from the campaign. There were, there were a number of writings that were surprises. We, we lost votes in the Chinese-Canadian community, for example. There's a number of reasons for that we're exploring. Um, and as leader, I'm committed to making sure we learn the lessons because our country needs a stronger economy, a, a prosperous future, an ethical government, and they're not getting that with the Trudeau Liberals. You say when you were in first place in the polls, people got nervous. What did they get nervous about in your view? Mainly about COVID. You know, it was unprecedented for the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, to pick fights with about five different premiers throughout the course of an election. You know mocking their response or criticizing their actions, that's not a sign of leadership. And it, it explains why we have national unity crisis in this country right now. But it worked politically. People were nervous about COVID, particularly coming in to seeing ICUs being um, filled up in Alberta, for example. Rather than working together, Mr. Trudeau used that fear. Um, I don't think that's leadership, but it produced a lot of people that were looking at us not voting for us. And I've got to, got to do better to, to secure that vote. We did grow the people that were considering voting. So our voter universe went up dramatically, but we didn't seal the deal, particularly here in Southern Ontario. And as a kid from Southern Ontario, I do feel responsible for not meeting what I wanted to do, but I, I, I know it's there next time. Uh, we'll pursue Southern Ontario and the rest of the province for that matter in a moment. But I, I, I do want to ask you this. You know, Justin Trudeau really seemed vulnerable the last two elections, both yours and Andrew Shears. I mean, he got the lowest percentage of the total vote, I think, in Canadian history for anybody who won an election. But he did win. He did win in both. He got two minority governments. And as much as you disagree with him, do you have to acknowledge that at some level, somehow, 
he has established enough of a connection with enough Canadians that they want him. Well, you know, I, I've joked with my wife, Rebecca, you know, I've been to Toronto for some meetings and some speeches, and I, if, if I counted all the people saying, hey, I voted for you, we, we need to replace Mr. Trudeau, I wonder how I lost the election, <laughs> Steve, because people are very uh, dissatisfied with Mr. Trudeau, and his surfing trip to Tofino on the first day of Truth and Reconciliation was another example of how he's constantly letting us down. But we do have to recognize they have been able to very effectively deliver their vote and demonize others. Uh, if you look at the, the end of the race, um, some of the attacks they were, were shelving on me, claiming Jagmeet Singh couldn't be a spot for some, some voters on the left and trying to consolidate. So they use fear and, and wedge politics better than I think any political party in the Western world, Steve. And does that mean we jump in and do that same type of division? I tried not to. Um, we're going to continue to talk policy. We think the economy is, is on life support right now. If you look at the risk of interest rates going up, you look at companies leaving and, and not having confidence in, in Canada. If you look at jobs, though, all the jobs have come back, but we're told anyway. We have job shortages across the country. You know, it's, it's time to end the CERB, Steve. You know, Mr. Trudeau has delayed the tough decisions of changing government supports within the pandemic because he was also buying votes in some cases, um, sending checks to seniors days before an election. Is that the best way to help the vulnerable seniors, for example? There was probably a lot of spending that wasn't needed, but Mr. Trudeau was buying votes. So we have to put forward a plan to get our economy going, making sure Canadian prosperity is there for our kids and grandchildren. I think. After the pandemic, when people look at the parties on their merits without COVID lingering over anyone, we win that election. I want to talk to you about MTV and not the video channel. I want to talk to you about Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver. Because in the biggest cities in this country, the Conservative Party won very, very few seats, as you know. And if you'd like, take a look at the monitor over there, because we're going to put up a map of the greater Toronto area, which you know very well. That little patch of blue on the east end there, I think that's your riding in Durham. But again, you haven't got much company up there. The, the Liberals, for, for a whole bunch of reasons, I guess, uh, are just, it's a fortress for the Liberal Party uh, in the greater Toronto area and through much of Ontario. What is preventing you, in your judgment, from connecting more with urban voters across this country? Well, we're doing analysis of our own exit polling, Steve. Those challenges are real. I'm not going to mask them. Um, some of the decisions I made as leader in the last year we're meant to show Canadians that whether it was climate change, whether it was Indigenous reconciliation, whether it was LGBTQ rights, I was going to make sure that the Conservatives were there to not just present ideas, but to make sure we had candidates from the LGBTQ community. Our, our new uh, MP in Thornhill, for example, uh, is another member of, of that community Melissa joining Lansman. our caucus. Melissa Frequent Lansman. guest on this program. A, a great, great Conservative uh, activist and advisor. She's now in our caucus. She's going to be fantastic. Um, we need to make sure those, those communities know we're taking issues they care about seriously and that we have conservative solutions. So your map shows we've got a lot of work still to do, Steve. The polls, when they were looking good midway through, people in those ridings were looking at us. And I really do think, had we not had the spike in ICUs and, and COVID roar back, some of the division caused by Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Bernier on the, the question of vaccines, would it have been a different result? Perhaps. But we, we lost. I'm the leader. I'm responsible. But our project to make sure that we reach out to voters in urban and suburban Canada is, is the fundamental question our party has to tackle before the next election. Since you mentioned Maxime Bernier, let me follow up with a question on him and his People's Party. Can you win an election in this country if he's eating 6 to 8% of your lunch each time out? He's not eating 6 to 8% of our lunch. And this is something some pollsters are already looking at, we've looked at. There is a portion of his vote that is conservative or, or right of center voter, uh, libertarian, absolutely. And I do think, you know, working better to, to, to show some of our ideas on effective government, uh, fiscal responsibility can probably bring some people back. But there were many candidates who were, who were kind of anti-GMO people. There were kind of anti sort of more green type voters running as PPC candidates. Uh, he got people that hadn't voted in the past to vote, um, motivated largely on, on the vaccine question. So he's not a deterrent to your electoral success going no, forward? No, you know, and we're not going to uh, use the division and, and 
quite frankly, his approach is divisive and, and divides the country, scares people in some cases. Uh, we want to be the centre-right option for Canadians concerned about their economic future, concerned about safety in their community, these sorts of things. But we are analysing all votes because I think we, we need to also have those liberal conservative switchers open to voting for us on economic grounds. Do they still exist? I know, like, uh, you know, I, obviously I'm steeped in the, in the history of this province and, and the, the so-called blue grits slash red Tories who would be those liberal conservative switchers who, if they sort of got tired of the liberals, might go to you. But I've been told by so many conservatives over the years, they don't exist anymore. What do you say on that? They do exist. In fact, I've been speaking with many of them in the last few days here in the, in the Toronto business community, getting ideas for the economic issues facing the return of Parliament. They want to see a strong economy. They want to see a private sector. They want to see risk-taking and innovation in Canada. Um, but they're socially progressive. They also wanted to see policies on the environment and, and other issues. We are providing that, but as a new leader doing everything through Zoom or, or my appearance on the agenda from a hotel room, not here in studio, it was a tough year to show people the Conservatives were putting forward ideas, even on areas where people think we felt short. Our housing policy was probably the best in the last election. We had commentators who haven't been generous to us in the last few years saying, Conservative Party has the best set of policies for the housing crisis in the GTA and in Vancouver. We need to continue to show people that we're going to tackle the issues they care about because there's a lot of voters in that realm because Mr. Trudeau is running more like a traditional NDP prime minister, not as a, an inheritor of the Paul Martin fiscal approach to, to governance. So we've got an opportunity with those urban and suburban voters. Let's talk leadership. How firm do you think your grasp of the leadership of your party is right now? Strong. We're united. We're, we're disappointed. No one more so than me, Steve. But we came very close and saw our vote share go up in many ridings that were literally a few percentage points difference would have elected Conservatives. In ridings like Kenora and Northern Ontario, we're seeing our vote go up in parts of the Windsor area, vote go up, our outreach to, to unions and to working Canadians going very well. In fact, we're giving Charlie Angus and people like that a run for their money. And I, I'm going to predict to you, we're going to win more seats in Northern Ontario in next Timmins? time. Timmins? James it, Bay? It, yeah. Timmins, James Bay, we were within 100 votes in Sault Ste. Marie, mm -hmm. and the Steelworker Local endorsed our Conservative candidate. So our outreach is working, Steve, but we also need to to show that we can keep the, the party and the, and the country united. So we're doing an exercise to make sure we learn why we fell short. We have one of our MPs, James Cumming, who lost in Edmonton doing a full review, including a review on me. What do you want to hear from him? How to tackle those maps in Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto. How to make sure we not just get people to kick the tires, because we're approaching now 50% of the population considering voting for us, but we didn't close the deal. How can we do that? Where did we fall short? We, we had some stumbles throughout the campaign as well, but overall ran a fairly professional campaign. Where can we improve? I've been involved in 360 reviews in the private sector, lessons learned in my military career. We have to apply that politically. But our caucus is united, and I've been quite reassured by how, uh, how positive they are on us, on us winning the next election. Andrew Scheer was tossed out pretty quickly after he lost the last election. Are you sitting here tonight telling us for sure that if you and I have a conversation in three months' time, you're still going to be the leader? I look forward to that conversation in three months' time as leader, Steve, and hopefully again in the studio, so you can have a few more guests in here. Um, Andrew, who's still a, a great member of our caucus, made the decision himself. Sure, there was a lot of swirl and... and and difficulty. He made the decision because they came at him with knives over and over and it, over again. It is, you know, sometimes a, a part of our party's DNA to do this to <laughs> ourselves. Um, I don't see that happening this time. And in fact, we had, in the words of some of my colleagues, one of the most productive post-election caucus meetings we've ever had. And I'm responsible for when we fell short. I, I, the buck stops with me. But people also know we were close to sealing the deal they knew that COVID came back. We did not politicize vaccines. And it was a tough position to be in to see Mr. Trudeau, who a few months earlier was praising me when my wife Rebecca and I uh, publicly got our vaccinations before he did. He praising me a few months ago and calling me an anti-vaxxer in the middle of the campaign. It was disappointing, but 
That's the liberal approach to politics. I think if people saw how we conducted ourselves and our economic vision coming out of COVID, if COVID isn't the ballot question next time, Steve, we win. I, I, I mean, I don't know why he said it, but he may have said it because uh, there were some of your members, there were some of your candidates who hadn't been vaccinated or weren't indicating that they would get vaccinated. And now, of course, the uh, Speaker of Parliament has decided that everybody, all members, have to be vaccinated if they want to go into the building. All the other parties are on the record as having said that all their people are vaccinated. You can't say that, right? We've always said that vaccines are critical and, and we need to encourage as many people to get vaccinated as possible. And our party encourages that. What and we've, some of your members aren't. What we've said is it is a personal health choice. And when we're trying to tackle that that remaining 10% of our society that may be not vaccinated has some hesitancy. The way you tackle that is by addressing it. And we've got a plan actually to do that without dividing people or, or having an us versus them. But the BOIE, the, the speaker, as you said, has, has decided and conservatives, as we always have, will respect all public health guidance, including in our own conduct as members of parliament. We've always said that Accommodating folks, a small number, using rapid testing and other measures is fair. I think it's actually in compliance with the charter as well. And, and I look at the difficult situation with healthcare workers. You know, we, we see shortages, we see burnout. Should we be trying as much as possible to deal with hesitancy without pink slips by working with a single dose non mRNA uh, vaccine, for example. Your, your position may be very reasonable, mm -hmm. but the speaker, the board of the eternal economy of parliament has still said, tough, that, that the, the O'Toole formula isn't good enough. We need everybody vaccinated. You can't say everybody in your caucus is vaccinated. We can say that we will follow all public health guidance. So, so Steve, the BOIE and the speaker have, have ruled and we will respect that, of okay. course. We, we also think though, that we have to look at not dividing people on this issue. It, it is difficult to see um, places where we're seeing people terminated, where in some cases, I think if we work smart and use all tools we have, we could probably avoid these sort of confrontations with just not politicizing vaccinations. Uh, I, I do wanna circle back to, the, to, to you. I wanna circle back to the issue of you because, um, well, put it this way, I don't know what James Cumming, your MP, former MP from Alberta, is going to come back with, but, but I suspect part of it is going to be, Aaron O'Toole, I've known you for 20 years, I always thought of you as a sort of a moderate red Tory, but when you ran for the leadership of the party, you ran as a true blue conservative, you hit all those hot buttons that true blue conservatives love about cancel culture and privatizing uh, CBC television and that kind of thing, and then when the election campaign started, you made a very deliberate decision to move your party to the more moderate middle in order to appeal to those liberal Tory switchers that you referred to earlier. I wonder if part of, I don't know, I'm just asking. I wonder if part of your problem here is that Canadians aren't clear in their own minds about what kind of a conservative you are. Well, I think there's some truth to what you're saying. Canadians not sure. They, they still don't know me as well as they think they, they might. In fact, our numbers went up dramatically as people got to know me, Steve. But our own exit polling said, some of the people that considered us but didn't close the deal, they're telling us, didn't know enough about Mr. O'Toole. So part of that is true. Part of it is not true. If, if you actually look at the leadership race, I'm a, a proud true blue conservative, but I stand up for the rights of all Canadians. And I have since the day I walked in the House of Commons. So I was even attacked for my position on LGBTQ rights, for example. But I'll make no apologies. I. I was in uniform to fight for all Canadians' rights and in our institutions, and I will always do that. I said we'd fallen short on climate change, and we needed a serious approach to tackling climate change. It's an important issue for me as a parent, as much as it is a conservative. And I'm a true blue conservative. I've served in the military. I've never asked for anything. I've put myself through school. You know my own background. I'm from Bowmanville. Um, I'm always going to fight for people that need a voice. And I don't, you know, I don't believe people that define conservatism in one way or another. What are you putting forward as leader? That's always how I've conducted myself. So I'm still as true blue today as I, as I was then, Steve. Okay, but some of, some of the members of your party obviously do, do define conservatism in one way or another, even if you don't. And if they thought, I know Aaron O'Toole, he's a true blue conservative who has these small c conservative views on a whole range of issues, and I like that about him, 
And then they see a guy who's trying to sort of drag, in some cases, kicking and screaming members of the party more to the center to broaden your appeal. Can you understand why they would be quizzical about what kind of Tory you are? Um, yes. And in, in fact, I don't profess that we were perfect. In fact, when I launched a very comprehensive climate change policy that has a price on carbon but not a carbon tax, mm -hmm. We stumbled a bit on how that got out. It was leaked. I hadn't been able to brief my caucus. Uh, the caucus felt disappointed by that. But in the election campaign, I'll tell you, I got a lot of praise from people saying, hey, it was great to see the Conservatives brought up an innovative approach to meet our Paris targets without the economic disruption of, of Mr. Trudeau's carbon tax. I can do that better next time by, I think, engaging caucus better by, by making sure we can get out and, and explain these issues better. But that some of those issues are being used as, as Aaron O'Toole departing from where he, he was in the leadership. But if you look, I was criticizing the leadership for saying we needed to be more serious on climate change. I want those urban voters in the, in the maps you showed, Steve, to know that on any issue that is of concern to their family, the Conservatives of Canada will have a solution for you. It will be free market based, it will be smaller government, it's not going to be a, an Ottawa knows best approach, but we have to show we're tackling the issues of 2021. Speaking of Ottawa, I gather you have a meeting with the Prime Minister scheduled at some point to talk about how things are going to work in this minority parliament going forward. Can you peel back the curtain a bit on, on how that works? Do you guys meet in person or do you do it on Zoom? Do you walk into that meeting with an agenda that you want to talk about? Do you do more listening than talking? Just Help us understand how that's going to work. Well, he doesn't reach out very often, to be honest, but we are having a call, a phone call today about the return of Parliament. And um, I'm very concerned about the economy. We saw inflation continuing to go up. Uh, we really think it's time to wind down the CERB and transition uh, all the national support programs into more targeted sector support. We, we ran on this, so restaurants, hospitality, tourism, some of the sectors that will continue to hurt Steve, that's where the support needs to go. But there's labor shortages. We can't just continue to, to have the CERB. It's disrupting our labor market. So I, I'm going to be talking to him about that. I, I really do think Parliament should be back sooner. It's a month since the election. And, and we're not going back for, for another month. Why the delay? He called this urgent pandemic once in a generation election. And then he's gone surfing and he, he's not taking his job seriously. So we'll be asking for, for him to put forward more of an agenda. And any time we can work in the best interest of the country, particularly to help get vaccination rates up, we will work cross-party. But we're also going to pro project some of our own ideas based on the recovery plan that we put out during the election. It's a minority parliament. Maybe we'll get some of our own ideas passed. I'm not going to do a sort of pop quiz with you here, but I'm going to mention a, name, a bunch of names here, all of whom you will know, and all of whom had something in common with you. Stephen Harper, Dalton McGinty, Bob Ray, Mike Harris, Lester Pearson. You know what they all have in common with you? They all won on their second election? Correct. They all lost the first time out, but they, won, they learned some valuable lessons in losing the first time out, and they won the second time round. Um, I want to know what valuable lesson you learned about yourself, about how you campaign, about how you relate to Canadians, that you think will be valuable for next time, presuming you get a next time, that you think might help you win next time? I think we have to get into our urban and suburban ridings better. Um, we did plan a very conservative or cautious campaign because of COVID health restrictions, Steve. So Mr. Trudeau broke many health rules in a pandemic election. We were extra cautious. And I think we, we paid a bit of the price for that. I should have been into some of the urban centers more uh, hearing from people more. We were trying to limit numbers and be very careful. But uh, I heard constantly from people, I didn't know much about you. I heard you answer questions. I heard you, you know, on your stump speech. So that was something I've got to do better on. I do think we need to make sure that we have uh, candidates that reflect all communities. We had the most diverse slate, but we lost some MPs that, that represented diversity in our party. So that's something that we have to work on uh, as a party. And, you know, Everything I do as, as leader in terms of how we, how we develop policy, I have to engage the grassroots and our caucus even better than we have. So it's been a tough year as a COVID leader that's given my 
Canadian club speech, not at the Royal York, like the tradition going back to Diefenbaker, but on Zoom. I'm looking forward to these real interactions. I'm going to be stronger next time, but I want Canadians that were considering us, stay tuned. It's, it's a Conservative Party that's going to be here to fight for you. I, I will, um, I hope you don't take this as uh, damning with faint praise, but I will say you have been far more responsive in answering my questions today during this interview than you were, say, with the gaggle of reporters who followed you around during the election campaign when they would ask questions and you would get on message track and not be the slightest bit responsive to whatever it was they were asking you about. Has that been one of the things that you've learned over the last few months that you need to do, actually be responsive to what people are asking as opposed to just saying whatever the hell it is you want to say? Well, I, I prefer in-depth interviews. That's why I love your program. It's one of my favorite shows because you're able to drill down. And in a campaign when you have 36 days and I'm announcing our housing policy, do I want to talk about what they want to talk about, which is not what I'm announcing? There is a healthy to and fro. Uh, it sometimes frustrated the journalists that I was trying to get my message sometimes? out. Sometimes? But Maybe I only have 36 days. Mm -hmm. and. And I often joke, Steve, I'm competing against a prime minister who people have known since he was born in 24 Sussex. I'm catching up and I had to get my message out. So there's learnings there too, 100%, but it's why I prefer this. I'm gonna be looking at doing some podcasts and other things where you can actually do a deeper dive. I'm a leader that not only reads the speech, I deliver, Steve, and that's where Mr. Trudeau and I are very different. He, he does not dive into the details on things. I do, and I think Canadians want a prime minister like that, so these more in-depth approaches rather than the firing line of a, of a press conference, I think will work with my style better. That's Aaron O'Toole. He's the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. He's the member for Durham, and he's been the first guest we've had in this studio in 19 months, which we're very pleased about. Aaron, it's good to see you again. Thanks for coming in. Great to be on the agenda, Steve. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.